Uh, I'm not going to talk about what we are passionate is about celebrating women today in my talk. I'm going to talk about women back to the 18th century, 19th century, and the 20th century. Uh, number two, uh, how many of you have watched the Qing Court TV drama about women? Please raise your hand. Don't, don't be shy. It's really nice. OK, many of you. So I'm actually going to talk about court women <laughs> in the Qing dynasty and what they have to go through. And, and also, I'm going to talk about another exhibition um, that we are doing at the Hong Kong Palace Museum celebrating uh, 19th century and 20th century women patrons as well as women uh, creators uh, in our museum. Uh, so, so very, very sorry, uh, Oceana. I, I, I select the wrong, wrong topic. <laughs> okay, uh, as an art historian uh, who, who is interested in women, I had this great opportunity to go into the Forbidden City and look at artworks really up close. And I was given the opportunity to go to their storage and looking at objects that might have been used by women and really to look at the texture and the color of women's life back to the 18th century, 19th century, and even early decades of the 20th century. As we all know, um, in many places around the world, there is something called women's history, right? We all know we are making history today. But oftentimes, you can find that women's history was often written in invisible ink. So my job was a detective. Um, and really to rediscover these amazing women in Chinese history. Um, so back to the 2018 and 19, I had this great opportunity to collaborate with many people around the world uh, in Beijing, in Washington, D.C., DC and in Boston to bring uh, this exhibition called Empresses of China's Forbidden City. Uh, really to help people to understand the journeys and, women, and, and stories of women. Uh, for the most part, these women's names could not even be pronounced by my uh, average visitors um, to these museums uh, in Boston and Washington, D.C. And also, if you look back, um, just five years ago or 80 years ago, um, there was um, something called the Me Too movement, right? So exhibition was not a really a feminist approach. We're just using a historical approach to look at um, women's um, influence in the field of art, history, and culture. But at the time, uh, we received a lot of media coverage international because in many places in the world, people are, are interested in this topic. People trying to connect these amazing women in China to whatever the issues they're encountering. So we have received a lot of great media coverage and attention as well. And also the curatorial team made a very good decision, very correct decision. Uh, as scholars, we have to put a book together for the exhibition, so we chose not a young women. <laughs> um, maybe even not so beautiful. We chose a senior women's um, portrait who was depicted at the age of 80 to celebrate her 80th birthday. So th she's our cover girl for that book. <laughs> so, so maybe I know, o Oceana, you have a lot of opportunities. Uh, maybe next time, even get somebody, even 90s, on your cover, right? <laughs> Um, so what we are trying to do is also to ask those question. Yes, sure, there are a lot of beautiful artworks associated with women, but a fundamental question is, what are the paths to power for these women in the society that's very much uh, patriarchal? At the court uh, is a male-dominated society, and even within the women's community, you can call it imperial harem, it's a ranked hierarchy. You know, the consorts of an emperor back to Qing Dynasty, there were eight ranks. That's why, you know, you, you're watching fun TV drama, right? Because a lot of competition. Um, and also, you know, there is no such a word that's kind of con in contemporary world we mean, you know, gender equality because it, there's a lot of parameters, constraints for these women. However, we found there are a lot of secrets to their path to the power. Um, for this woman, yes, this senior lady, um, 
one of her secrets to the path of power is motherhood. Um, today, some you know, women leaders always struggle life and work balance. You know, motherhood can be challenging, right? But back to the 18th century, a senior woman can rose to the top of power because she gave birth to the next emperor. And also, she's celebrated because of her generational seniority. She's the mother. So the emperor right there never bowed to anybody never said a size to anybody, but he has to bow to his mother. He spoiled his mother and make her the most powerful woman in China at her time. Um, so that is really important. You know, um, I think that today there's a lot, a lot of topics about aging uh, gracefully and healthily and celebrate your age and experience. Um, so I hope that we can get a lot of inspiration from history. Um, Another path to power, even back then, is a woman's intelligence and her skills. You think, ah, maybe women beautiful, sure, you know, you can get, you know, give birth to a lot of boys to become the next emperor, sure. But this lady, her name is Xiao Xian. Um, I call her, uh, her nickname to me is Mona Lisa of China. She had this really sweet smile, you know, her um, slightly upturned lips is really sweet. Um, you know, we know she's beautiful. Um, she is the wife of the Qianlong Emperor at the time, the most powerful ruler on earth, anywhere in the world. And of course, you know, she has a lot of power. One of her jobs is really not so admirable, is to lead the women's community. Remember eight ranks? A lot of beautiful, intelligent women, smart women, competitive. They all want to climb ladders. And you know what? She is appreciated, not just um, because she's beautiful. Her husband commented on her. She died at the age of 36, and that guy was devastated for the next 50 years and wrote 100 poems to commemorate her. So one of her really important um, virtue is she is generous and kind to anybody and everybody around her. So at the imperial court, very peaceful, no backstabbing, okay? <laughs> and even her maids respect her very much. Um, so, you know, she left no writings, you know, she didn't, you know, wrote, wrote any books or poems. Um, but also, you know, women, she's an intelligent woman. She has a lot of management skills, right? She could be a really, really good head of HR. In any big companies, we have a lot of competitive, problematic people. And also, very importantly, is women has a lot of soft power back then. Remember, this is a court uh, that upholds the rule. Um, women shall not rule, right? However, women can claim powers in other fields. Um, so very importantly, I also find that women back then really take good care of themselves. They take seriously uh, the idea of culture, the idea of beauty. So we also discovered that many objects previously we thought, oh, so nice, you know, it's national treasure, must be used by emperor. That's not true. We find um, senior women or high-level women at the court can enjoy some of the most sumptuous objects at the court. So look at this picture. Um, not only a beautiful vase, but did you notice how exquisite the composition is? The women, she's wearing a beautiful silk robe decorated with the same pattern that decorates the vase. So next time you go to a party, a dinner party, first ask the host, what will be the pattern of your dishes? <laughs> then you dress up to it, right? <laughs> so that is a level of, you know, the appreciation that you had for women at the, at the court. And there's a lot of bias for sure. Even today, uh, as I mentioned, when you go to auction houses, you shop sure, you know, this is Yongzhen Emperor's commissioning, this is Qianlong Emperor's commissioning, the guy's commissioning. Sure, ceramics is a very important way for emperor to articulate their cultural power and financial power. But also, we have this wonderful woman, you're not, um, it's not unfamiliar to us, her name is Empress Dowager Cixi. Cixi, right, really important. She is 
um, the only imperial women who use ceramics um, to, to really to claim her cultural power because she personally commissioned imperial ceramics. And who is this lady? Okay, she started as a low rank counselor, eight, you know, eight ranks, right? She started really low. Um, however, she has some incredible skills. She's beautiful, she's really smart, has superb people skills. And it happened to be she gave birth to the only boy of her husband. No competition, really. Um, what happened to her is also her husband died at a very young age. So he left behind two widows, two widows as another empress dowager and a young boy, really, really young boy emperor. Uh, what also happened is that um, there were eight male ministers trying to grab power from these two widows. What happened to her? She formed alliance with the other women. Eh, there's also rumor that they, they were competitive, sure. Um, but she formed an alliance with her. And also, she also get the support of her husband's brother, uh, basically her brother-in-law. So they launched a coup and seized the power and punish these eight ministers. So this woman started an era in Chinese history called ruling behind the curtains. So we have two widows, two women ruling and telling this young boy emperor what to do. And she ruled China uh, starting from the second part of the 19th century to the early parts of the 20th century for nearly half century. Of course, you know, you, you Google her, there's a lot of bad stories about her as well. Um, but history has often been unkind to women leaders like her as well. Now, very quick shift uh, from China to France to Europe that I want to welcome you to see the Cartier Women exhibition. Uh, I also want to share with you that um, this exhibition was curated by a curatorial team at the Hong Kong Palace Museum, also partly because of our interest in women's history and our commitment to rediscover women's role and presence in all our exhibitions as much as possible. So, of course, you know Cartier, but you may not know. Cartier was founded uh, in Paris in 1847. Only nine years after its establishment, it welcomed its first royal patron. It's not a guy, it's a lady. Her name is Mathilde Bonaba. Her family is really important. She's the niece of Napoleon. Okay. This lady is remarkable. So our exhibition started with, with her amazing story because she was married to a Russian noble person who refused to give up his mistress. So what happened to her? She abandoned him and fled back to Paris and started her new life as a hostess of the art salon. She welcomed many uh, artists in her salon and live an artistic and independent life. Well, she lives in the 19th century, early part of the 20th century. In the, 19, in the 1920s and 1930s, you got a Chinese woman. Her name is Wen Xiu. She was married to Pu Yi, China's last emperor, right? She became I don't think she was inspired by her, by the way, but she became the first and the last woman who dared to divorce an emperor in China <laughs> because women's status change. She can, she can go to the court and divorce an emperor husband. We also um, have another path to power. We talk about beauty, we talk about soft power, we talk about um, your people skills um, and motherhood. Another path to power is learning and knowledge. And this lady, her name is uh, Queen Elizabeth, but she is the Queen Elizabeth of the Belgians. She was active in the first decade, uh, first few decades of the 20th century. Uh, what happened to her is um, she actually had a degree in nursing. So during the First World War, um, she did something really bold. She changed the palace in Belgium into a hospital, unlike what we did during the COVID time. 
and she personally hold in her hands many in her arms, many wounded soldiers who are waiting to be amputated. Basically, on the, she changed her palace into operation, into operating rooms. Um, and she's so smart, and also she actually was a very accomplished uh, musician as well. Uh, excels at uh, violin playing as well as plan piano playing, and she also fabulous and stylish. And she changed a beautiful uh, Cartier tiara into a bam door, so that she has more freedom when she wear this beautiful um, jewelry piece. In addition to celebrating women patrons, in this exhibition, we also celebrating women artists. Um, you have heard of Katia for sure, but you may not know that um, starting from 1930s, um, Katia's design was very much dominated by a lady called Jean Toussaint. She became the first female creative director in the industry that was also dominated by Guy. Sure, Coco Chanel, fashion industry, natural. You have women um, leading the industry early on. But in jewelry making, you know, if, if you think about stone cutting, if you think about the setting, metal work, that was very much a guy's world. Even the salesperson at the Cartier back to 1930s, sales guy, salesman, because they were selling things to male patrons who would buy things and give to their wife or mistress or daughters and sisters. Because at the time, men wield a lot of financial power. And to, to end, uh, I, I still think that I'm the wrong speaker. So I'm really looking forward to so many wonderful, wonderful colleagues and friends here. Um, and I also thank Prestige uh, colleagues for hosting this wonderful networking events for us to celebrating what we have accomplished and celebrating each of your accomplishments. Um, so let's also um, welcome our next amazing speaker and also fabulous storyteller, our amazing Gigi Chow.